you have a copy of God's Word with you today, I encourage you to join me in John chapter 4. We'll be in verses 43 through the end of that chapter today as we uh, continue on looking at the Gospel of John. We'll continue in John till the end of May, and then we're going to take a break for a little while from John, and we're going to uh, journey through some of the Psalms together, and then we'll be back in John as we uh, get into the fall together. And so, uh, looking forward to uh, a little bit of mixing things up as we get into summer, uh, but uh, looking forward to what God's going to share with us today. Were y'all blessed by the worship today? I was blessed, particularly blessed. Uh, grateful for our worship team and, and Devin's leadership, and uh, just grateful of what God's doing in that place. Let me pray for us real quick as we dive into God's Word. Mainly, I'm praying for me that I won't get in the way. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your word. We thank you for how you speak into our hearts and life. Father, I pray that whatever you want to say and do, we would have hearts receptive, ready to hear from you. Well, I pray that as we look at how you work in power and might in this royal official's life, Father, may we see the importance not to have a faith based on you doing something for us, but to have a faith based on Christ and Christ alone. Father, I pray that you lead and guide and direct us in this time. I pray that you speak and move in power and might. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Growing up in the home that I did, uh, my mother was a single mother, and, and so I had never really known what a brand name of any food product looked like in our home, we always bought the store brands. Can I get a testimony? People grew up eating the store brands, maybe a best value or great value or whatever. I, I, I never knew what it was like to, to see a, a brand name of anything. As a matter of fact, I didn't, I didn't know there was such thing as Coke until I got into the youth group. But it was in, I grew up with a store called Kroger in Memphis, and it was always Big K Cola is what we had. And so I just thought that was soda. I just thought that's what it was. And so I grew up with that. And, and so I went to college and I got exposed to some name brands, but being that I was on a budget with buying my groceries in college, I bought the brands that mom brought because it went a little further and that's why she did it. And then I, I got exposed to, to uh, name brands a little bit more uh, in Julie's home and her family. Her mother always bought name brand uh, on, on a lot of things and especially when it came to cereal. And I'll, I'll say this, having been exposed to all of them, I'll say that there's one particular thing where I just honestly have to have the name brand. And that's when it comes to Rice Krispies. <laughs> there's a fine line between cereal and cardboard there, isn't there? And so when you're making Rice Krispie treats, it's just, it's just better to have those, or at least, at, least, at least those when they're fresh, it's better to have the name brand Rice Krispies. And I, and I can have someone get, uh, bring Rice Krispies, or I can eat a Rice Krispie, and I can quickly tell, was it made with cereal or cardboard? I mean, you just can't tell people, well, I can't tell, and, and maybe, but, but for me, in my taste bud, that, that's just me, and, and, and I know I'm going to probably pay for that at some point uh, in the future. Uh, that statement I just made. But, but the reality is that for me, I could tell that, that if something is the, the name brand or it's not in that particular instance. A lot of times I can't. But that one thing I, I can tell. We all have a particular food or thing that we can spot when it's not the real thing. It may be a food that you like to eat, and whenever you get that food, you know if this is made the way mom used to make it or grandma used to make it or, or if this food is a particular brand or a store brand, and, and you can just tell. Maybe it's a particular shampoo. Your hair doesn't have that particular bounce if you don't have the right shampoo. That doesn't affect me. That affects you. Um, it may be a particular brand of tool. Maybe you're a mechanic and you like to work on things. And there's a particular brand of tool that if you're not using that, it just doesn't feel right. Things just don't work right. You have to have that particular thing. You can tell when something isn't the real thing. When we encounter the thing that's not real, we can spot it, can't we? The, thing, the, saying, the same thing is true when it comes to faith. There's real faith and there's counterfeit faith. See, counterfeit faith looks really good on the outside. It looks just the same. See, those that have a counterfeit faith, not in Jesus Christ, they, they can go to church every Sunday and they can look really good to the outward appearance. 
They can go through all the motions. They know all the words. They know all the things to say. They know all the things to do. And it may look like they've got their act together on the outside. Those that possess a counterfeit faith. But counterfeit faith is very different than real faith. See, real faith is placed in Jesus Christ alone. Real faith is placed in Jesus Christ alone. Not what he does for us, not what he can do for us, not, none of those things. Even though he can do, he's able, he's capable, but our faith for salvation is placed in Christ, in Christ alone. And it's not, uh, not counterfeit, it's real, it's not something on the outside, it's something that's been transformed on the inside. There's something different about those who have real faith than those who have a counterfeit faith. John chapter 4, after Jesus having this encounter in Samaria, he's going from the southern region of Judea through the area just north of it, Samaria. He meets the woman at the well and has this encounter whereby she's changed. She meets Jesus. She finds that he is truly the living water that she's been thirsting for. She trusts in him as Messiah, places faith in him, and then begins to share him with the people in the, the village of Sakar. And her village is turned upside down by this Jesus who stays a couple of days teaching and they said, the people in Samaria said, we don't believe just because of your testimony, but we believe because we've heard it from Jesus ourself, that he's the Messiah. And after this encounter, amazing encounter in the first part of John chapter uh, 4, we see that Jesus continues on to the region that's even north of Samaria, the region of Galilee, where Jesus spent a lot of his earthly time in ministry. And Jesus encounters... Two kinds of faith. He encounters a counterfeit faith and he encounters real faith. And Jesus makes a distinction between these two. Jesus shows us what real faith looks like. And so today as we journey through this encounter in verses 43 through 54 of John 4, we're going to learn three characteristics of what real faith looks like. The first thing we'll learn about real faith is real faith is unconditional Look with me in verses 43 through 48 so we can get an understanding of where this encounter is going. And so it says in verse 43, After the two days he departed for Galilee. So he's leaving Samaria and he's continuing northward to Galilee. And he goes, in verse 44, is kind of an aside. John would make statements like this and they're always put in parentheses so we know that it's just kind of a commentary by John. It says, For Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in his own hometown. Jesus is going up into Galilee. And, we'll, and there's 45 says, and so when he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him, having seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the feast, for they too had gone to the feast. Verse 46, we meet someone else. So he again came to Cana in Galilee, where he made, uh, had made the water wine. And at Capernaum, there was an official whose son was ill. And when this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. And so Jesus said to him, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. I really believe that statement I just read from the words of Jesus in verse 48 is the key to understanding this encounter. I believe Jesus was making a distinction between those who have real faith and those who have counterfeit faith. Those who, who truly believe in him and those who believe as long as he's doing what they want. And he tells us here, he says, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. See, real faith is unconditional. Jesus sees these crowds and he sees the, the lack of authenticity about the faith of the Galilean believers. Surely they welcomed him. Surely they were glad he was there. Surely they were good, glad to see Jesus, but they were only glad to see him because they had seen all that he could do in Jerusalem. They had seen him at the feast. They had seen the miracles. They had seen the stuff. And their faith was placed in the miracles that Jesus could do and the, the things that he could accomplish. And that's why Jesus said, unless you, by the way, that you is plural, see signs and wonders, you, plural again, will not believe. Now, what kind of conditions do those who possess counterfeit faith place on Jesus because real faith is unconditional two conditions we see here 
The conditions the Galilean folks that, that said they placed faith or said they trusted in him, these people believed Jesus as long as he could amaze them. And the condition some people place is, God must amaze me before I believe, or in order for me to believe. Jesus moves from Samaria to Galilee, the same region where he had turned water to wine in John chapter 2. He encounters a group of locals that were aware of, of what he had done, and they were glad to see him. They were glad to see his miraculous abilities, and they welcomed him. They go, we have this miracle worker. He's coming to our town. They were so glad to see him. Many folks, just like these, today are the same way when it comes to Jesus. As long as he's amazing me, as long as there's a crowd, as long as things are going well, as long as I'm being entertained, as long as these things are happening, as long as blessings are heaping up in my life, as long as amazing things are happening or miraculous things are happening, then I'll follow Jesus. But those things ever pause or stop for a moment, I'm backing away. And that's counterfeit faith. Counterfeit faith trusts in Jesus. I mean, real faith trusts in Jesus alone. Counterfeit faith places conditions like amazement. This week, Julie and I went to, someone got us tickets to a Branson Music Fest. Got to sit right next to Gary and Mary. Now, they, love, they love music. They're clapping, having a good time. It was great. I'm sitting right next to Gary and Mary. I'm, I'm having a good time. And for three and a half hours, I sat in my seat and watched show after show. I get much over 35 minutes and people are like, mm, preacher. I mean, I know, I understand. And for three and a half hours, I'm just there. I'm there. Why? Because I'm entertained because who's the center of attention? It's all about me. It's all about my entertainment. It's all about my amazement. And these Galilean people were the same way. They welcomed Jesus. They were so glad he was there because they thought he could do something for them. Is that what our faith in him is based on? It should be based on the fact that he is the only way to the Father. It should be based on the fact that he is the only one who can save us. And if Jesus saves you from your sin, he's done enough. He's not required any more miracles. He's not required any more amazement. He may choose to do so, but our faith can't be based on those things. And real faith is unconditional. It's not based on what God can do for us. It's based on what God's already done for us. It's based on the finished work of Jesus on the cross. And these folks were basing their faith on what he might do for them. They're basing on what he could do. How he could. And the fact is that for most of God's word, God's people walk without much fanfare miracles. The wilderness wandering of Israel, yes, they had the pillar of cloud and the fire, but for the most part, there was not a whole lot happening. I mean, occasionally things happen. God did things, water from rocks and stuff like that. You go to the book of Acts, people read the book of Acts and go, oh, there was nothing but miracles happening all the time. No! There was a miracle, and then there'd be some time go by, and then there was a miracle, and there was some time go by, and there was a miracle. God wasn't just feeding their need for miracles. He was just proving himself to different groups of people. So many times we place the condition upon God that God must amaze me before I believe. Another sign of counterfeit religion or condition of counterfeit faith is that God must answer us in order for us to believe. After this group of Galileans, in comes a man from Capernaum. His son has a fever. He is dying. He is at the point of death, and he does not know where to turn, but he hears there's a miracle worker, and he comes in in verse 46, and it says, So he again came to Cana in Galilee, says where he had, verse 46 says, where he had made the water wine at Capernaum, there was an official whose son was ill. Verse 47, here's where we get the meat of it. When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. And it's at that point that Jesus responds, Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. See, for many people, unless God answers their request, they choose not to believe. See, Jesus was calling this man to make a choice. Was he going to place his faith in Jesus or place his faith just in what Jesus could do for him? Was he going to place his faith in a condition of the outcome of a prayer? Or was he going to place his faith in Jesus and Jesus alone is the Messiah and the, indeed the Savior of the world? The reality is, as many of us have placed the same conditions upon God. We believe in God as long as God does something for him, as long as God moves in some way, as long as God answers a particular prayer. 
Many people will come to church, and, and maybe this is your story. You come to church, and just things are either not right in your life, or not right in your marriage, or not right in your career, and, and you're looking for answers. And you're praying, and you're hoping maybe God, find that, is God the answer? You don't necessarily need the answer to your prayer. You need the one who answers prayers. You need him. You need him in your life. You need him to work and move and power in your life. And the reality is when you begin to follow him and be obedient to him and, and, and walk, work, walk and step with his word and what the word of God says, then you'll find yourself experiencing some joy and peace in those areas. Things won't be perfectly smooth. He won't answer every prayer the way you want it answered. Many times he'll say no, or not yet, or one day. The danger with this sort of faith placed in answers or conditions of prayer is, is that it makes us the master rather than us trusting the one who is the master. Jesus, when teaching his disciples to pray, here's what Jesus said to them. He says, pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, whose will be done? Thy will be done. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It, he, Jesus said, we're not asking God to accomplish our will in our lives. We're not wishing him to accomplish what we want in the earth. When we pray, we're going to say, God, what we want, we want your will to be done in the earth today. Counterfeit faith places conditions of amazement and answers for prayer. But real faith places no such conditions. Jesus says so in verse 48 when he says, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Second thing about what real faith looks like, not only is it unconditional, it's transformational. We're, we're changed when we place our trust in Christ. When we genuinely believe in Jesus Christ alone for salvation and for leadership and direction and guidance of our life and Him to be the Lord of our life, verse 49 says, the official said to him, Sir, Come down before my child dies. He goes, this, he's urgent. And Jesus said to him, these are powerful words. Go. Your son will live. Go is an imperative. Your son will live was a future. He said, you go. I've handled it. And then, he says, the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. When he was going down, the servant met him and told him that his son was recovering. So he asked them the hour when, this began to, when he began to get better. And, and they said to him, yesterday, at the seventh hour, the fever left him. Real faith is transformational. We are changed when we place faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone for the forgiveness of sin and for the lordship and leadership and direction of of our life. It changes us. There's a couple of areas we see here that, that this man was changed. He, he was changed in his beliefs. See, real faith transforms how we believe, how we trust. Most time we trust what we can see, but, but this man went beyond that. He trusted simply in the words of Jesus. Verse 50 says this, Jesus says, go, your son uh, will live. And then verse, the end of verse 50, it says, and this man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him. He said, okay, you said it, I trust you. This is the transformation that happens when a person places their faith in Jesus. They simply believe what he said. Now, we all struggle with doubt. We all struggle with uh, things. We all struggle with temptation to, to not believe what God said. And I love what Pastor Warren W. Wearsby said. He says, there's a difference between doubt and unbelief. Doubt is a matter of the mind. We cannot understand what God is doing or why he's doing it. But unbelief, it's a matter of the will. We refuse to believe God's word and obey what he tells us to do. Let me read the last part again. Unbelief is a matter of the will. We refuse to believe God's word and obey what he tells us to do. One of the evidences that a person has placed their faith in Jesus is that they simply, like this man, take him at his word. They just take him at his word. I want to ask you, you just take Jesus at his word. 
Do you believe it to be true? Do you believe that what he says about life is true? Do you believe what Jesus says about your soul and about sin and about death and about life is true? See, folks, that is real faith. Real faith is taking Jesus at his word. We all have doubts. We all struggle. I, I, this guy was struggling at this point to, to believe, but, but when Jesus said it, he just believed him. See, real faith transforms our, what we believe, but it also transforms our actions. I, I love what we see happening at the end of verse 50. It says, And the man believed the word Jesus spoke to him and did what? He went on his way. It, it literally means he departed. Jesus said it, he believed it, and he went back home. It says in verse 51, And as he was going down, his servant met him and told him that his son was recovering. He's making the multiple, the, the day's journey and, and back to Capernaum, and on the way his son comes back and goes, it, it's okay. And Jesus never put a hand on this young man. And Jesus never showed up at the guy's house. But Jesus spoke it. And this man believed and he acted on it. See, the reality is, is that real faith acts on what Jesus has said in his word. Real faith acts on the word of God. We hear God, sense God calling to us. We read God's word and we sense a command and call to do something. And we are obedient to it. We go, we do what God has called us to do. When I was called to ministry as a young man, I struggled. I told this before, I said, I said when I went to go to ministry, I said, I'm going to do music ministry. I can't play harmonica, okay? And so I was like, <laughs> that's not going to work. You can sing a little bit in the shower when no one's listening, okay? It's just, that's not, you know. And, and so I said, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to be a missionary. And I was like, you know, and I started finding out what missionaries did and sacrifice. I'm like, I don't know about that. I'm going to be a youth pastor. But the calling of my life was to preach. But I didn't like to stand in front of people. I stammered and stuttered. Still probably do that to some degree. But I sensed God calling me to it. And he began to confirm it with his word. And he began to confirm it as other people began to see what God was doing in my life. And began to encourage me and pray for me and and ask how they could help me as I sensed and, and walked in what God was calling me to do. See, this model of faith of acting on what God has said is what we see throughout all of Scripture. Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. Since God tells him, I want you to leave the land that you know and go to a place that I will show you. Abraham packs up his family and he heads out. He believed and he acted. We see Moses leading the nation of Israel out of Egypt by faith. We see Peter walking on water by faith. His faith wavers, but he walked on water. That's more than any of us. And Paul took the gospel to the Gentiles. All of that by faith. Acting, being obedient to what God has said in his word. What about you? Has real faith changed the what you believe? Do you read God's word and believe it to be true and so believe it to such a degree that it changes how you act and how you live? Do you believe the great commission that's called to take the gospel to the ends of the earth so much that you would act on it and be obedient to it? See, real faith is unconditional. Real faith is transformational. But, but one more thing we see here. Real faith is contagious. Look, look at verses 53 and 54. His father goes and he asks this Servant of him, he asked him, when did his son get well? And the servant told him it was the seventh hour. And verse 53 says this. The father knew that was the hour when Jesus had said to him, Your son will live. And he himself believed in all his household. And this was now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea to Galilee. Real faith is contagious. It spreads like wildfire. When someone really trusts Jesus, really believes Him, they, they're trusting Him without any conditions placed upon it, and their, their life has been changed. People want to see what's happening there. People want something of that. They, they, they take notice of it. It's contagious. It's not transferable, but it's, it's contagious. Now, how does that happen? 
How, do, how does real faith in Jesus Christ alone spread from one person to the next? What, two things. Number one, people will see your faith. People will see your faith. Look, look at verse 53. It says, The father knew it was the hour when Jesus had said to him, Your son will live, and he himself believed in all his household. The household saw a changed man. He left Capernaum, he went to Cana, he came back, and he was not the same. He was transformed, he believed Jesus. His actions reflected a belief in Jesus. If you place faith in Jesus alone, it will be obvious to those around you. People will see your faith in Jesus. Jesus put it this way in Matthew 5. He says, you are the light of the world. I love this illustration Jesus gives. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket but a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. Now listen to this. In the same way, let your light shine before others so they might see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. The bottom line is folks don't want a counterfeit religion. You can fool everybody in this room, but you can't fool the people you work with, and you can't fool the people you live by, and you can't fool the person who sits on the couch next to you. People will see what you believe in. They will see if your faith is real or not. They will see if your faith is real or counterfeit. They will see if it is genuine and true, because when life gets difficult and the suffering comes in and trials come in, they will see a faith that is true and pure and refined. Because it's placed in Jesus Christ alone and not what Jesus can do for you. I love what Jesus says also later on in that same sermon. He said this in Matthew 6, 31 and 32. He says, therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear for the Gentiles? Listen to this. The Gentiles, that means the unbelieving. Seek after all these things and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. I want to ask you, is your life radically different than those who don't know Christ? Does your life reflecting a transformed life? Does your faith in God, not based not on conditions, but based on the fact that Jesus is worthy of your worship? Or do you live a life that looks like Jesus said to these in Matthew 6? It really doesn't look different than anyone else. When life gets difficult, you just act like everybody else. When things are tough, you just act like everyone else. See, the reality is, is that contagious faith is something that people will see. Not only will people see our faith, but people will trust our Lord. Look, look what happens at the end of verse 53. It says, he himself believed in all, in all his household. Whole household. Everybody. Everybody believed. Everybody believed the words of Jesus. Everybody placed trust in Jesus because of the witness and testimony of this man. Because his life was so radically different. That's contagious faith. That's what happened when we place our faith in Jesus Christ alone. That's what happens when we believe what Jesus said and we act on it. People will see our faith and trust our Lord. Robert Coleman wrote a book, uh, master plan of evangelism, and he, he made this statement in one of his writings. When our hearts are filled with Christ's presence, evangelism is, an, is as inevitable as it is contagious. Let me say that again. When our hearts are filled with Christ's presence, evangelism as, is as inevitable as it is contagious. Yesterday, we were in our breakfast fundraiser for a Mexico mission trip and um, I'm you know just kind of sitting back and thanks to the generosity of our church and others there's like over three thousand dollars given toward that trip and praise the Lord for that we are we are grateful for that and uh and blessing by a lot of soccer balls that we can use for evangelism and they're in other ways I mean it's just it's great but Gary told a story that really struck me and, and I wish I could get him up here just to go ahead and tell it real quick. But, but in summary, he told the story about sharing the gospel with somebody with that soccer ball. You've probably heard it. And four people heard the gospel that day because that man got so excited, he kept going and getting to people and bringing them back. What if that was us? 
What if our faith in Jesus, and we really believe what he said, and we really acted on what he said, and we really believe that Jesus Christ called us to the work he's called us to, would we not be those kind of people that we keep going out and finding people that don't know Christ and bringing them to the living water and introducing them to him? See, real faith is contagious. Today we learn how to recognize real faith, that real faith is unconditional and it's transformational and it's contagious. But I want you to consider yourself. What about you? Is your faith in Christ alone? Or is it in some condition that God might do for you? If God does A, then I'll do B. Or is your faith in Him? No matter what He chooses to do, Because he's the only way to the Father. He's the only way to be forgiven. And he's the only living water that you've really been spending your whole life searching for. Is your faith in him and him alone? If you're here today and you look at what we've heard today and you look at the story and you go, I've been living a counterfeit faith. I've been fake and phony. I've been playing the games. I've had everybody fooled, including those living in the house with me. It's time to get real with God today. It is time to place your faith and trust in Him and move from a faith that's built on sifting sand to one that's built on solid rock, and that rock is Jesus Christ. If you're here today and you've never placed your faith in Jesus, there'll be some pastors available. We'll be available sitting in the front of these two side sections. We'd love to talk with you. There'll be some deacons available. We'd love to pray with you. We'd love to help any way we possibly can. But if you're here today and you say, a counterfeit faith describes me, and I need to place my faith in Jesus, we'd love to talk with you today. Maybe you're here today and, and you say, you know what, I have a real faith. But I haven't been walking by faith. I haven't been acting on it. I believe Jesus, I trust his word, but I haven't been living by faith each and every day. I want to encourage you today as a believer to make a commitment today to start walking by faith. God calls you to do something, to talk to someone, or maybe to give to someone, or maybe to share with someone, or maybe to to minister to someone, to, to just by faith trust that he will supply what you need in that moment. You know what Jesus told his disciples? Don't don't worry about what to eat when he sent them out. Don't don't worry about all that stuff. Don't worry about what to say. I will give you what you need if you'll simply be obedient and follow after me. Maybe God's calling you to do the same. Maybe it's someone across the street. Maybe it's someone across the dinner table. Maybe it's someone in the break room. He's calling you to share your faith with. Will you be bold enough to trust him and take him at his word and act on what he said? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for how you speak into our heart and life. And Father, we thank you that you call us to not base a faith based on what you can do for us or a faith that is not active and not real, but 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 you call us to a real faith in Jesus Christ alone. So while I pray today, if there's somebody here today that's never placed their faith in your son Jesus, I pray today, today would be the day that they see their sinfulness. They see that Jesus is the only way, the only living water they've been thirsting their whole life for. And they would see the need to place their faith in your son Jesus today. But also I pray for those that are here that are believers. They place their faith and trust you. They have a real faith, but they've been struggling to walk by faith. I pray today that you'd give us holy boldness to walk by faith so we might have a contagious faith that changes people in our homes, It changes people in our community. It changes people in our workplace, wherever we go. May we have a contagious faith.